Shabbat Shalom. I'm Rabbi Yuri Korshun, and this is Live from Home. I want to welcome our Beth Israel Messianic Synagogue members and all our podcast listeners from around the world. This is Erev Shabbat on Friday, April 23rd, 2021. This evening, Eric Painter will welcome us to his home and lead us in Hebrew prayers and worship. After that, I will join live from home as we study this week's Torah and scripture readings. Right now, I want to ask you to hit the share button on this Facebook page so you can invite your Facebook friends to join us as we are getting started. Also, please hit the like and the follow buttons and join in with your comments. From Ina and me, Shabbat Shalom. Now let's join Eric from his home. Shabbat Shalom. Let's begin our worship tonight uh, with singing together in the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. The children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, observing it throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me says the Lord.
enter through the blood of the Lamb. We enter to worship you only. We enter to honor I am. Lord, we be 
Thank you, Eric, for that wonderful time of worship. Now I want to give special thanks to all who are faithful supporters of Beth Israel. Such support gives us stability and allows us to expand our efforts to serve our community. I believe that the Lord is pleased with our faithfulness to Him. If Beth Israel is a blessing for you, please consider blessing Beth Israel as well as that allows us to be a blessing to still others. We are grateful for your cheerful generosity and the sacrificial giving of your tithes and offerings. You can find information about how to give online at bethisraelnow.com slash giving. Our online giving platforms are giving Fire and PayPal both very secure and easy to set up. Now I would like to read update from Rabbi David and Rabbi and Sandy. They are sending their greetings to all the Mishpacha at Beth Israel. I would like to read their message. Dear Mishpacha, here's an update from my one month post heart surgery follow up. My doctor has told me that my healing is proceeding as expected. And in the next eight week period, I can carefully increase some activities but must be very careful till everything is neat back together. The surgeon said that it was good that we ha had quarantined ourselves in the last year, which the, uh, with these hidden blockages. Today, he said, COVID would have been fatal for me. Sandy and I are committed to continuing on this cautious and steady road to recovery. This four week post-surgical period was encouraging for us. Thank you for your prayers, cards, letters, emails, and texts. I believe your love and prayers have been of great benefit to me, Rabbi David. Thank you, Rabbi David. So let us pray for Rabbi David for his restoration, recovering, and for safety and for blessing over him and Sandy. Lord, thank you so much for Rabbi David. We bless Rabbi David in the name of Yeshua. We bless Rabbi and Sandy. Lord, we ask continue to heal him, restore him, bless him work with him lord right now give him shalom and rabbit and send your shalom thank you so much for rabbi david thank you for his healing thank you for his restoration in the name of yeshua amen amen now let's proceed with this week bible readings our topic for today is the restoration of what has been destroyed it is a very important and a very deep subject for us Today, I would like to look with you in this week's Haftorah portion and take special note of some lessons waiting there for us. It is a very interesting uh, place of scripture, so please open it with me. It is a book of Amos, prophet Amos, chapter 9, verse 11 and verse 12. It is a very interesting place of scripture. So, Amos 9. 11 and 12. In that day, I will raise up David's fallen sukkah, or it can be read as tabernacle. I will restore its breaches, breaks or holes, raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in days of old. So they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations called by my name. It is a declaration of Adonai, the one who will do this. Before moving on to these verses from the prophet of the book, I want to look at the tabernacle of David and see how it was different from the tabernacle of Moses. It is very important to see difference. What was the main difference between the tabernacle of David and the tabernacle of Moses. So, the tabernacle of Moses consisted of three parts. The outer court, 
the holy place and the holy of holies. In the outer courtyard, there was an altar and a lever, a large container filled with the water in which the priest performed ritual ablution, washed themselves before entering the tent. People could come freely into the outer court to offer their sacrifices to God. And it was here that the daily sacrifices and prayers were performed in the, in the courtyards. Inside the courtyard, there was also a large tent, which was off limits to all except the priests. This tent was divided into two parts. The first called the holy place and the second, the holy of holies. Three times, uh, three items were in the holy place. There was a golden menorah having lights which were supposed to be constantly burning. There was a table called the table of showbread on which the priests offered special bread daily as a sacrifice to God. And finally, there was an altar of incense. And only priests could enter the holy place and only with the blood of the sacrifice. The bread for the table and in order to keep the fire of the golden menorah alive. The holy place was separated from the other part of the tent, from the holy of holies, by a large curtain. This was the very curtain that was torn from top to bottom many centuries later in the temple, at the very moment of Yeshua's sacrificial death. But until the time, the curtain was always necessary to hide the holy of holies. And only one item was behind that curtain the Ark of the Covenant, in which there was a container of manna from those 40 years in the desert. There were the tablets of the covenant, which Moses brought down the mountain. And there was a piece of wood, the rod of Aaron, which constantly bloomed in the presence of God. Please consider this. If a dry piece of wood comes to life and bears leaves in the presence of God, then how much more will we, how much more will our souls come to life and become fruitful in His presence? The glory of the Lord constantly resided in the Holy of Holies, and therefore only the High Priest could enter there, only once a year on Yom Kippur, on the very day of Yom Kippur. And the only purpose for which the, he could enter was to bring an annual sacrifice, a cleansing sacrifice for himself, for Israel, and for all mankind. Except for the high priest on Yom Kippur, no one ever had the right to go there, as his entry was certain death in the presence of the glory of God. We read about it in the previous chapters. So the Holy of Holies was the heart of everything. It was the center of everything. The century in which resided the presence of the Lord. It was everything. Presence of the Lord in the Holy of Holies. So, but what about Tabernacle of David? Tabernacle of David, there were no se sec sections. The Tabernacle of David was so different from Tabernacle of Moses. Of course, we don't have exact description, but according to some Bible scholars, according to some uh, people who are uh, learning about that, it was a large tent with the Ark of the Covenant in the middle. There were no curtains behind which the Spirit of God was hidden away. And round the clock, worship and praise of God was conducted in this tabernacle without any interruption. And the presence of God filled the entire tabernacle. Every Le Le Levite who participated in worship and entered the tabernacle of David to worship could feel the Lord in the tabernacle. Now I would like to, uh, to say a very important part. Please consider what a step was for King David 
to bring only the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem without the tabernacle of Moses. One cannot overstate the significance of the change from the tabernacle that God said should be built for him. I would like to read from 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. Then David and all the people who were with him arose and set out from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which called by the name, the very name of Adonai Tzavot, who is enrolled between the cherubim. By doing this, King David changed many procedures of priesthood in the tabernacle of Moses. And the tabernacle of Moses no, was no longer functional. Priesthood and Levite ministry moved to Jerusalem with Ark of the Covenant. What a drastic change it was. I believe this decision was a prophetic act. David was a picture of Messiah who was to come. And we know that Yeshua was called the son of David. David brought the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of the Lord, out of Holy of Holies to the people of Israel. There was no curtain, no division between the Lord and the people who worshipped him. It really reminds me of the coming of Yeshua, who really brought the change, who changed many things. It is in John, uh, Yohanan chapter 4, I would like to read it. John chapter 4 started with verse 21, and please read it with me. It is about Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord. John chapter 4, verse 21. Yeshua tells her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Your worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And verse 23. But an hour is coming, it is here now. So Yeshua was with her, <laughs> the Lord of Lords. But an hour is coming, it is here now, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people as His worshippers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. I want to read some interesting passages from the book of Psalms and ask one important question, very important question at the end. So first place, it's Psalm 23, verse 6. Very important place of scripture. Psalm 23, 6. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Adonai forever. Verse, uh, Psalm 27, started with verse 4. One thing I have, have I asked of Adonai, that will I seek, to dwell in the house of Adonai all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of Adonai and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will hide me in his sukkah, conceal me in the shelter of his tent and set me high upon a rock. Then will my heart be high above my enemies around me. In his tabernacle I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, sing praises to Adonai. So here's the question. What house of the Lord is David is talking about? Because we know that only his son, later, his son Solomon, was able to build the temple for the Lord. Of course, David is talking about the tabernacle that contained the Ark of the Covenant. 
He's talking about tabernacle of David. He's calling it house of the Lord. About the constant worship that took place there in the presence of God's glory. And what's interesting, in Amos chapter 9, the Lord promises to restore exactly the tabernacle of David. Not the tabernacle of Moses, but tabernacle of David. This very tabernacle. So interesting, so prophetic. What does this mean for us today? Some scripture teachers claim that Amos is telling us about the restoration of worship in the body of Messiah. Someone sees in this chapter a prophecy about the restoration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Lord restores both. And it is in his perfect will that in his house, his children worship him. That the Holy Spirit can perform miracles and change the hearts of people. The tabernacle of David is all about praising God, about worshiping him, about joy, about music, about freedom of the spirit in his presence. And above all, his prophecy, this prophecy of Amos, speaks of God's promise of a great restoration and awakening in Israel, revival in Israel, in the land of Israel. The Lord promises to restore his presence among the people of Israel, such as was in the tabernacle of David, where people could enter into his presence with joy, with worship, enter in his, his house. We are living in unique prophetic times that the Bible says so much about. With our own eyes, we see the fulfillment of God's promises. You are part of a fulfillment of God's promises. He is making history today. Both Israel and you and I, we are all part of that history. And if you never thought of yourself as a historical figure, it is time to change your thinking. For sure, I know that many difficult things are happening in the world today, illness and death, wars and rumors of war, crisis on every hand, so that it can be difficult to see the hand of the Lord. Nonetheless, He is still at work. The Lord, He is still at work. Let's take a look at how the apostles explained the prophecy of Amos at the first council in Jerusalem. At this council, we can find about this council, council in Acts chapter 15. So let us open uh, Acts chapter 15 and we'll read from, uh, from this place of scripture. At this council, they decided whether non-Jews could believe in Yeshua as their Messiah, or they should first be converted to Judaism. It was a huge question. It was a question of great significance for the body of Messiah. The first congregation of Jerusalem was about to split on this question. It was so serious. It was a crucial moment in the history of the church. The historical moment which changed the course of the history of mankind forever. This very day, this very council changed so many things. This was the time when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Jewish people and many Jews became messianic in their understanding and conviction. Even many priests and Levites became messianic believers. It, this was the time when the Holy Spirit began to fall on non-Jewish people. So let us read Acts chapter 15. Let's start with verse 8 and we will go to verse 14 later. So here's the Peter or Shimon. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them by giving them the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, just as He also did for us. And let's skip to verse 14 and start with verse 14. Here's Apostle James or Jacob, Yaakov. He's uh, repeating Simon uh, or Apostle Peter. Simon has described how God first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for his name. And verse 15. 
the words of the prophets agree, as it is written. After this I will return and rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. Namely, all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says Adonai, who makes these things known from old. So, he is speaking from book of uh, Amos chapter 9, the same very prophecy about restoration of the tabernacle of David. It is an interesting fact that Apostle James, from all the prophecies of the scripture, selected only this one from the book of Amos chapter 9. It shows me that this place from Amos is a very important and had a great influence on the first believers. Why it is so? Why it is so important? It is very obvious. In time of King David, it was revolutionary that he brought Ark of the Covenant without the tabernacle of Moses into Jerusalem and built the tent where the presence of the Lord was not hidden from people and everyone could enter to worship there. In the very same way, the decision of the first Messianic congregation was a revolutionary idea which changed the face of the world and brought revival to the nations, to the nations. Before that, non-Jew can come into the temple without being converted to Judaism. Very interesting. Here the Apostle James and Peter clearly talk about revival in the rest of the nations and explain that this is part of the fulfillment of the promise given to Israel. This is the great revival of the Jewish people, the restoration of the tabernacle of David. God's presence in Israel, which leads to revival throughout the whole world. The apostles clearly said that the restoration of the tabernacle of David is the spiritual awakening of Israel through faith in Yeshua. Through faith in Yeshua. I believe that one of the important parts of this prophecy speaks about the restoration of the Messianic movement, about the revival of the Jewish people as worshippers of God who will be filled with the Holy Spirit and how it was during the tabernacle of David, they will bring God's presence to the land of Israel and to the ends of the earth. The existence of Jewish Messianic communities, congregations, what seems common to us today, it is in the fact a manifestation of the great miracles of God. Think about it. Just a hundred years ago, no one could have imagined what the restoration of faith in Yeshua, the messianic awakening in the Jewish environment would come. There was officially only one Jewish messianic community in the city of Kishinev, Moldova, where the leader was Joseph Rabinovich and several small missions on the face of the earth that worked with the Jewish people leading people to knowledge and faith in the Messiah Yeshua. In the Christian environment of that time, only 100 years ago, no one knew or understood what the Jewish Messianic community was and how a Jew who accepted Yeshua as his personal savior could remain a Jew. No one understood how a Jew could accept Yeshua without renouncing his Jewishness, without a conversion to the religion known as Christianity. It was only 100 years ago. Think about it. Today, it is probably not possible to count how many Jews in this world are believers in Yeshua or how many hundreds of Jewish Messianic communities and groups are worshiping Yeshua today. But these happenings are for real. They are heart and soul of the fulfillment of that prophecy and promise of a spiritual revival of the Jewish people. 
we can read much about this in Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. And let us read Romans chapter 11, starting with verse 25. Romans 11, verse 25. And let us read with all our intention. It is an important place. Verse 25, Romans 11. For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own eyes, that a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer shall come out of Zion. He shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. A very, 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 very clear message it was to the Roman believers on that day. And still it is to this day for any who will read this chapter from Romans. Such an incredible message in just these few words. All Israel will be saved. In another translation, all Israel shall be saved. No doubts, no question, no what if, no buts here. All Israel shall be saved. How wonderful it is to know the end of history and although the battle is still ongoing and there will be many difficult battles and perhaps may not be so victorious, we already have a great promise of salvation and know that we will be winners in the end because always all Israel shall be saved. And, you know, the book of Apostle Paul to Romans from chapters 9 to 11 tells us very clearly that the God First, God protects his people Israel and all believers in Yeshua from all tribes of the earth. The second idea, he is faithful to his promise to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and will always be faithful. Do you remember that promise in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3? My heart's desire is to make you into a great nation, to bless you, to make your name great so that you may be a blessing. My desire is to bless those who bless you, but whoever curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I really believe that Yeshua is the blessing for all the families of the earth. He is the main blessing to all of us, to the Jewish people and to all Gentiles who comes to faith in Yeshua, to faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob through Yeshua. And the third thing, we know that he will complete his work with Jewish people, begun with his plan for Abraham. We know that not only he will save the entire Jewish people who will live in the end times, but also bring the message of salvation to all the nations on the earth. It is so important. I would like to read from Romans chapter 9, verse 1, 2, and 3. It is very interesting places of Scripture. I tell the truth in Messiah, and this is we need to, to, to understand very clearly. This is Apostle Paul, Rabbi Shaul. He's saying here, I tell the truth in Messiah. I tell the truth in Messiah. I do not lie. My conscience assuring me in the Ruach HaKodesh, that my sorrow is great and the anguish is in my heart unending. For I would pray that I myself were cursed, banished from Messiah for the sake of my people, my own flesh and blood. I know that many people are ready to give their lives for the salvation of their souls. But the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, as he calls himself, is ready to sacrifice his eternity and salvation and grace for the repentance of his brothers and sisters, the Jews. 
one of the reasons we can find in chapter 11, verse 15. Romans 11, 15. Here's the, an important truth, an important truth for all of us to remember, to understand, to grasp. For if their rejection, Jewish people, Jews, leads to the reconciliation of the world, what will be their acceptance but life from the dead? What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Paul realized from the scriptures that the salvation of Israel means the coming of the Messiah and the restoration of the world. Rabbi Shaul, we know him as the Apostle Paul, understood this great secret from the prophecy in the book of Amos about the restoration of the fallen tabernacle of David's. He perfectly understood that when spiritual awakening comes to the Jewish people and the presence of the Lord returns to Zion, at the same, very same time, the Lord moves in his salvation throughout the whole earth, saving people from all nations of the earth. I believe that we need the kind of love and motivation that the Apostle Paul had. I would like to remind us again, Today we live in special prophetic times, which the scripture calls the last times. Before our eyes, Israel was restored. Thousands of Jews, Jewish hearts are coming to repentance. What was recently impossible and no one believed, today is an everyday reality. Israel will be saved. But the question is here, what we can do about this? In conclusion, this last one important thought for today, very important, last but not the least. <laughs> but what is it, revival of the Jewish people? How should we understand this awakening? In the minds of many sincere believers, revival is when the Lord himself descends from heaven and does all the hard work for us. A huge crowd of people gather and everyone will immediately repent of their sins and be saved. Of course, of course, the Lord is almighty and he can do as he wishes. But we must remember the example from the Bible, from the New Testament, that the crowd is good, but the revival in the scripture is so much more than just a crowd. I still remember the impact on me of a book I once read, read, which was titled, Awakening Begins With Me. Awakening Begins With Me. Each of us is a barrier of God's glory. Each is a part of the tabernacle of David. Everyone is important to the Lord and loved by him. Remember that by serving God in your place, by serving in the place you live today, by serving faithfully and with grateful heart, you build up his tabernacle and bring the coming of our Messiah closer. On behalf of the Lord, I want to thank you for your faithfulness in all things, for your service, for your presence in the community, for your participation and prayers, for your offerings and tithes, for being with the congregation, a part of the congregation for holding the congregation together in both easy and difficult times. This is the building of the tabernacle of David. I believe that the Lord, today the Lord is revealing and reviving local congregations where his children can gather together. This is very important. This is exactly what today's Torah chapter speaks about, uh, half Torah chapter speaks about. And I would like to mention also that uh, today's Torah chapter, Leviticus 16 and Leviticus also 23, is the center of the Torah scroll in the Masoretic text. And the message of this Torah portion is in scripture is about the message of Yom Kippur, the message of atonement, the message of salvation, the message of the restoration of a destroyed world, destroyed world. This is the central theme of the Torah. This is the central idea of the Bible. 
This is the good news. And we as Messianic believers have the confidence that there is a sacrifice for each of us, a perfect sacrifice, an internal sacrifice, a sacrifice that satisfied the Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, High Priest of future blessings, once entered the Holy of Holies and acquired internal redemption. Eternal redemption. At this very moment, he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, showing him five wounds received as our ransom and pleading our case. What a great gift from God for us. How much he loved us. Thank you for your attention. In the end, I want to remind you that if Beth Israel is a blessing to you, please consider to be a blessing to Beth Israel. I will close with Aaron, Aaronic benediction, Aaron's blessing, as we normally do at Beth Israel, and then we'll return to painter's home for a final worship song. Let us pray together. Lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Shabbat Shalom, Mishpacha. Shabbat Shalom. We sing, Lord, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. And in six days you painted the face of the earth. Lord, we delight in your Shabbat. From now the day when you rest from your work. Lord, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. The prophets foretold the Messiah would come. Lord, we delight in your Shabbat. My Israel, the Lord God is one. Lord, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. And just as you rested and your work was done, Lord, we delight in your Shabbat. We enter your rest by the work of your Son. Lord, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight, we delight in your Shabbat. We delight, we delight.